Welcome back to the Seaport in Boston, Massachusetts, with City's Crazy, with Bruins and Celtics talk, but we're here, we're talking Red Hat, Linux, OpenShift, Ansible, and Ashesh Badani is here, he's the Senior Vice President and the Head of Products at Red Hat, fresh off the keynotes, had Amex up in the state, Ashesh, great to see you face to face. Amazing that we're here now after two years of, of the isolation economy. Welcome back. Thank you, great to see you again as well, and you as well, Paul. Yeah, so no shortage of announcements uh, from Red Hat this week. Paul wrote a piece on siliconangle.com. I got my yellow highlights. I've been through all the announcements. Which is your favorite baby? <laughs> Hard for me to choose. Yeah. Hard for me to choose. Um, I'll talk about RHEL 9. Right, RHEL 9 is exciting. Um, and in a weird way, it's exciting because it's boring, right? Because it's consistent. Um, three years ago, we committed to releasing a major RHEL every three years, right? So customers, partners, users can plan for it. Um, so we released the latest version of RHEL. In between, we've been delivering um, releases every six months as well, minor releases. Um, a lot of capabilities that are bundled in um, around security, automation, edge management. And then RHEL is also the foundation of the work we announced with GM. Uh, with the in-vehicle operating system. So, you know, that's ex extremely exciting news for us as well and the collaboration that, that we're doing with them. Uh, and then a whole, whole host of other announcements around, you know, cloud services, uh, work around DevSecOps and so on. So, yeah, a lot of news, a lot of announcements, I would say, RHEL 9 and the work with GM probably, you know, comes right up to the top. I, w I want to dig into one aspect of, of the RHEL 9 announcement, and that is the, uh, the uh, role of CentOS streams in that development. Now in December, I think it was, Red Hat discontinued development or support for, for CentOS and moved to CentOS streams. I'm still not clear what the difference is between the two. Can you clarify that? Yeah. I think we go into a situation, especially with, with uh, many customers, many partners as well, that you know, didn't sort of quite exactly uh, get a sense of you know, where CentOS was from a lifecycle perspective. So was it upstream to RHEL? Was it downstream to RHEL? Um, what's the life cycle for it itself um, uh, as well? And then there became some sort of you know, implied notions around uh, what that looked like. And so what we decided was to say, well, we'll make a really clean break and we'll say CentOS stream is the upstream for enterprise Linux. Um, from day one itself, uh, partners, uh, you know, uh, software partners, hardware partners, can collaborate with us to develop RHEL and then take it all the way through lifecycle, right? So now it becomes a true upstream, a true place for development for us, and then RHEL essentially comes um, out as a series of releases based on the work that we do in a fast-moving CentOS environment. But wasn't CentOS essentially that upstream uh, development environment to begin with? It was what's actually, the difference between CentOS and CentOS Stream? Yeah, it wasn't, wasn't, um, it wasn't quite upstream, it was actually a little bit downstream. Yeah, it, so it was right? kind of bi-directional. Yeah, and, yeah, and so then, you know, that sort of became an implied life cycle to it when there really wasn't one, but it was just became one because of some usage and adoption. And so now this really clarifies the relationship between the two. Um, we've heard feedback, for example, from um, software partners, users saying, hey, what do I do for development? because I used you know, uh, uh, CentOS in the past, so we're like, yep, we have RHEL for developers available. We have RHEL for small teams available. We have RHEL available for nonprofit organizations. Uh, and so we've made RHEL now available in various form factors for the needs that folks had, and they were perhaps using CentOS for, because there was no such alternative for RHEL historically. So language, so now it's this clarity. So I mean, that's really the key point there. So language matters a lot in the technology business. We've seen it over the years. We've the industry coalesces around you know, terminology, whether it was the, the PC era, everything was PC this, PC that, the internet era, and, and certainly the cloud. We, we learned a lot of language from the likes of you know, AWS, two pizza teams, and right. working backwards, and things like that became common, commonplace. Hybrid and multi-cloud are kind of the, the, the parlance of the day. You guys use hybrid. I, you and I have talked about this. I feel like there's something new coming. I don't think my term of super cloud is the right necessary right. terminology, but it signifies something different. And I feel like, Ashesh, your announcements point to that. Within your hybrid umbrella, point being so much talk about the edge, and it's, we heard Paul Cormier talk about new hardware architectures, and you're seeing that at the edge. Right. You know, what you're doing with the in-vehicle operating system. These are new, the cloud isn't just a, 
a bunch of remote services in the cloud anymore. It's on-prem, it's a cloud, it's cross clouds. It's now going out to the edge. It's something new and different. I think hybrid is your sort of term for that, but it feels like it's transcending yeah. hybrid. What are your yeah. thoughts? You know, really, really great question. Actually, since you and I talked, Dave, I've been spending some time, mm -hmm. you know, sort of noodling just over that, right? And, and you're right, right? There's probably some terminology, something sort of, you know, that will get developed, you know, either by us or, you know, uh, in collaboration with the industry. You know, where we sort of almost have the, the next, almost like a meta cloud, right? That we're sort of working our way towards because there's, if you will, you know, the cloud, right? So, you know, on-premise, you know, uh, virtualized uh, bare metal, by the way, you know, increasingly interesting and important. You know, we do a lot of work with NVIDIA. Folks want to run specific workloads there. Uh, we announced support for ARM, right? Another now popular architecture, especially as we go out to the edge. Um, so obviously there's private cloud, public cloud. Then the edge becomes a continuum now, you know, on that process. Um, we actually have a, a major uh, a shipping company, so a, a cruise lines, that's talking about using OpenShift on cruise lines, right? So, you know, that's the edge, right? Last year we had Verizon talking about, you know, 5G and, you know, RAN and the next generation there. To them, that's the edge. When we talk to retail, the storefront's the edge, right? You talk to a bank, you know, the bank environment's the edge. So everyone's got a different kind of definition of edge. We're working with them. And then when we, you know, announce this collaboration with GM, right? Now the edge there becomes the automobile. So if you think of this as a continuum, right? You know, bare metal, private cloud, public cloud, take it out to the edge. Now we're sort of almost, you know, living in a world of, you know, a little bit of abstractions and making sure that we are focused on where uh, data is being generated and then how can we help ensure that we're providing a consistent experience regardless of, you know, where that I like meta, meta cloud because I can work in NFTs, uh, I can work a little, uh, uh, we're, I we're can work in get metaverse. this whole thing without saying metaverse, <laughs> I was hoping. <laughs> I do want to ask you about, about the edge and the proliferation of hardware platforms, Paul Kirby, mentioned this during the keynote today, hardware is becoming important. Because yeah. There's a lot of purpose-built yeah. hardware, hardware that's in development now for areas like, uh, like uh, intelligent devices and AI. Uh, how does this influence your development priorities when you have all these different platforms that you need to support? Yeah, so um, we, we think about that a lot, mostly because we have engagements with so many partners in hardware, right? So obviously there's the more traditional partners, I'd say like, uh, the Dell and the HPEs that we work with. Uh, we've historically worked with them, also working with them in, in newer areas uh, with regard to appliances that are being developed. Um, and then the work that we do with partners like NVIDIA or new architectures like ARM. And so our perspective is this will be uh, use case driven more than anything else, right? So there are certain environments, right, where you have ARM-based devices other environments where you've got specific workloads that take advantage of being uh, built on GPUs um, that we'll see increasingly being used, uh, spe especially to address that problem and then provide a solution towards that. So our belief has always been, look, we're going to give you a consistent platform, a consistent abstraction across all these you know, pieces of hardware. Um, and so you, Mr. and Ms. Customer, make the best choice for yourself. A couple other areas we have to hit on. Uh, I want to talk about cloud services. We, we got to talk about security. Sure. We'll, have, we'll leave time to get there. But why the push to cloud services? W what's driving that? It's actually customers that are driving, right? So we have um, customers consistently been asking us, say, you know, love what you give us, right? Want to make sure that's available to us when we consume in the cloud. Um, so we've made REL available, for example, um, on demand, right? You can consume this directly via public cloud consoles. We are now making it available via marketplaces. Uh, we talked about Ansible, um, available as a managed service on Azure. OpenShift, of course, available as a managed service in multiple clouds. Um, uh, all of this also is because you know, we've got customers who've got these uh, committed spends that they have you know, with cloud providers. They want to make sure that the environments that they're using are also counting towards that. And at the same time, give them flexibility, give them the choice, right? If in certain situations they want to run in the data center, great, we have that solution for them. Other cases they want to procure from the cloud and run it there, we're happy to support them there as well. Let's talk about security, because a lot of announcements, it's like security everywhere. Yeah. Um, and then some specific announcements as well. I, I always think about these days in the context of the solar wind supply chain hack. Would this have, you know, how would this have affected it? But tell us about what's going on in security, your philosophy there, and the announcements that you guys made. So, our security announcements actually span our entire portfolio. Yeah. 
right? And, and that's not an accident, right? That's by design because, you know, we've really uh, been thinking and emphasizing, you know, how we ensure that security profile is raised uh, for users, both from a, a malicious perspective and also helping accidental issues, right? So, so, so both matter. So, one, uh, huge amounts of open source software, you know, out of the world, you know, and then estimates are, you know, one in 10, right, has some kind of security vulnerability um, in place. A massive amount of change in where software is being developed, right? So rate of change, for example, in Kubernetes is dramatic, right? Much more than even than Linux, right? Entire uh, parts of Kubernetes get rewritten over, over a three year period of time. So as you uh, introduce all that, right, being able to think, for example, about you know, what's known as shift left security or DevSecOps, right? How do we make sure we move security closer to where development is actually done? How do we ensure we give you a, a pattern? So you know, we've introduced a software supply chain pattern uh, via OpenShift, um, delivers complete uh, stack of code that you, know, you can go off and run um, that follows best practices, uh, including, for example, for developers you know, with GitOps and support on the pipelines front a whole bunch of security capabilities in RHEL, um, uh, a new uh, uh, IMA's integrity uh, measurement architecture which allows for uh, uh, better ability to see in a post-install -in environment uh, what the integrity of the packages are, um, uh, content signing technology, they're incorporating OpenShift as well as an Ansible. So it's, it's a long, long list of capabilities and features and then also more and more defaults that we're putting in place that make it easier, for example, for someone not to hurt themselves accidentally. Yeah. On security front, I noticed that uh, this today's batch of announcements included support within OpenShift pipelines for SigStore, which mm -hmm. is an open source project that was birthed actually at Red Hat. Right. Uh, we haven't heard a whole lot about it. How important is SigStore to, to uh, you know, your future product direction? Yeah. So look. I think of that, you know, as you know, work that's you know being done out of our CTO's office, um, and obviously security is a, is a big focus area for them. Um, Six Store is a great example of saying, look, how can we verify content that's in uh, containers, make sure it's you know digitally signed, that's appropriate uh, to be deployed across a bunch of different environments. Uh, but that thinking isn't maybe unique uh, for us uh, in the container side, mostly because we have you know two decades or more of thinking about that on the RHEL side. And so fundamentally containers are being built on Linux, right? So a lot of the lessons that we've learned, a lot of the expertise that we've built over the years in Linux, now we're starting to you know, use that same expertise, starting to apply it to containers. And I'm, my guess is increasingly we're going to see more of the need for that you know, into the edge as well. I, I, I picked up on that too. Let me ask a follow-up question on SigStore. So if I'm a developer and I, and I use that capability, it, it ensures the provenance of that exactly. code. Is it immutable, the, the signature? Uh, uh, and the reason I ask is because, I, again, I think of everything in the context of the solar winds where they were putting code into the, the, the supply chain and then removing it to see what happened and see how people reacted, and it's just a really scary environment. Yeah, the hardest part you know, in, in these environments is actually the behavior change. So what's an example of that? Um, Packages built, verified, you know, by Red Hat. When it went from Red Hat to the actual user, have we been able to make sure we verify the integrity of all of those when they were put into use? Um, and unless we have behavior that you know makes sure that we do that, then we find ourselves in trouble. Um, I see. In the earliest days of OpenShift, uh, we used to get knocked a lot by by developers because they said, "Hey, this platform's really hard to use." We investigated, "Hey, look, why is that happening?" So. By default, we didn't allow for root access. You know, and right. so someone's using you know, the OpenShift platform, they're like, oh my gosh, I can't use it, right? I'm so used to having root access. We're like, no, that's actually sealed by default because that's not a good security best practice. Now, over a period of time, when we you know, ran that enough times, explained that enough times, now behavior change, it's like, yeah, that makes sense now. Right? So even just kind of you know, this behavior, so the more that we can do, for example, in, in you know, the shift left, which is one of the reasons, by the way, why we bought uh, Sacrox a year ago, ah, right? Yep. right? Mm -hmm. For declarative security, contained native security, so threat detection, network segmentation, uh, watching intrusions, you know, uh, malicious behavior, is something that now we can you know, essentially make native into uh, development itself. All right, I'm going to escape key, talk futures a little bit. So I went downstairs to the expert, you know, ask the experts, and there was this awesome demo, I don't know if you've seen it, of, um, it's like a design thinking booth, 
with what happened, how you build an application. And I think they were using the WHO, one of their apps mm -hmm. um, during COVID. And it's, you know, shows the, the granularity of the, the, the stack and the development pipeline and all the steps that have to take place. And it strikes me of something we've talked about. So you've got this application development stack, if you will, and the database is there to, to support that. And then over here you've got this analytics stack, and it's separate. Mm -hmm. And we always talk about injecting more AI into apps, more data into apps, but there's separate stacks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you see a day where those two stacks can come together, and if not, how do we inject more data and AI into apps? What are your thoughts on that? So that's another area we've talked about, Dave, in the past, right? Um, so we definitely agree with that, right? And, and what final shape it takes, you know, I think we've got some ideas around that. What we started doing is starting to pick out specific areas where we can start saying, let's go and see what kind of usage we get from customers around it. So for example, we have OpenShift Data Science, which is basically a way for us to talk about ML ops, right? And you know, how can we have a platform that allows for different models that you can use, we can, uh, test and train data, different frameworks that you can then deploy in an environment of your choice, right? And we run that uh, uh, for you uh, and assist you in, in um, uh, making sure that you're able to take the next steps you want with, with your machine learning um, algorithms. Um, there's work that we've uh, introduced uh, at Summit around uh, database as a service, so essentially our uh, 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 a cloud service that allows for DBaaS, an easy way for uh, customers to access either MongoDB or, or Cockroach in a cloud native uh, fashion. Um, and all of these things that we're sort of you know, experimenting with is to be able to say, look, how do we sort of bring the worlds closer together? Right, off database, off data, off analytics, with a core platform and a core stack. Because again, right, this will become part of you know, one continuum that we're going to work with. It's not, I like your continuum. That's, that's I think really instructive. It's not a technical, barrier is what I'm hearing. It's maybe organizational mindset. I, can, I should be able to insert a column into my, uh, my, my application you know, development pipeline right. and, and insert the data, I mean, right. Kafka, TensorFlow, in there. There's no right. technical reason I can't, can't do that. It's just we've created these sort of separate stovepipe organizations. 100% so, right, right? So they're different teams, right? You got the platform team or the ops team and you got a separate dev team, there's a separate data team, there's a separate storage team, and each of them will work you know, slightly differently independently, right? So the question then is, I mean, that's sort of how DevOps came along. Then you're like, oh, wait a minute, yeah. don't forget security, and now we're in DevSecOps, right? So the more of that that we can kind of bring together, I think the more convergence that we'll see. Yeah, when I think control. about the in-vehicle OS, I see the, the, that is a great use case for real-time AI infrastructure referencing, right. streaming data. La and last I wanted to ask here. you that, about that yeah. real quickly, because at the very, you know, just before the conference began, we got an announcement about GM, about your yep. partnership with GM. It seems like this came together very quickly. Why is it so important for Red Hat? This is a whole new category of, of application that you're going to be built working on. Yeah, so we've been working with GM, not publicly, uh, for, for a while now, um, and it was very clear that, look, you know, GM believes this is the future, right? You know, electric vehicles into autonomous driving. Um, and we're very keen to say, we believe there are a lot of attributes that we've got in RHEL that we can bring to bear in a different form factor to assist with the different needs uh, that exist um, in this industry. Uh, so one, it's interesting for us because we believe that's a use case that you know, we can add value to. Um, but it's also the future of automotive, right? So the opportunity to be able to say, look, we can get open source technology, we can collaborate out with the community to fundamentally help transform that industry uh, towards where it wants to go. Uh, you know, that, that's just the passion that we have that you know, is what wakes us up every morning. So you're, you're, you're opening into that. Yeah. Ashesh Padani, thank you for coming on theCUBE. Really appreciate your time and your insights and uh, have a great rest of, rest of the event. Will do, thank you for having me. MetaCloud. It's a thing. <laughs> it's a thing, right? It's it's, it's kind of there. We're gonna we're gonna see it emerge over the next Talk decade. All right, <laughs> you're watching the Cube's coverage of Red Hat Summit 2022 from Boston. Keep it right there. But right back. <laughs>